Good morning, church family. Welcome to CVC Online for another Sunday worship service. Today we're joined by our pastor of counseling and soul care ministry, Pastor Larry Cordero. Thanks for joining us, Brother Larry. Ben, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, while the building's been closed, we know that the counseling ministry has been more active than ever. So share a little bit about that with us. Let me tell you, the five and a half months that have gone by with COVID shut in has been like a blink of an eye for the counseling center. The, the quarantine has kind of affected a lot of people in a lot of different ways. I just saw a stat earlier today, actually. Unfortunately, uh, the divorce rate is up 34% in America. And so I know that we have a divorce care ministry within our counseling centers. Maybe you could share a little bit about that with us. Well, certainly we too have experienced the influx uh, just by the, the applications that are coming in for marriage counseling. We do offer a divorce care ministry. We offer it twice a year, September and then January. Uh, we're getting ready to start one September 13th. Uh, we'll facilitate that class via, Z via Zoom okay. from 10.30 to 12.30. Great. So that's, a, that's one week away already. It seems like it's just a blink of an eye away. So it may seem obvious, but who should consider registering for that program? Anybody who's decided that... Uh, they're going to go through the divorce, anybody who's been divorced, uh, anybody who's been divorced for a month, a, a year, it doesn't matter. Uh, we need to learn how to, uh, how to resume our relationship with God and mm -hmm. how to resume our relationship with our church body. And that's Amen. what divorce care does. Amen. Well, thank you for providing that, uh, that need, filling that need in our community. Um, how would we go about registering for that? So people can register really easily if they get on the CVC website and the, there'll be a link provided. If they click on it, provide easy registration uh, instructions and then a facilitator will contact them by phone and uh, they'll let them know how they can come by and pick up their uh, reference material. Beautiful. We'll drop a link in the chats as well so you can click on that easily to register for the Divorce Care Ministry starting up this Sunday, September 13th. September 13th. 10.30 a.m. And... Uh, what should they expect to experience throughout that program? They can expect to experience a renewal, a renewal of the relationship with God first and foremost. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times in a marriage, we focus so much on our spouse rather than our God. And what divorce care does, it helps us to re-engage our relationship, our priority with our God. Wow. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you, Pastor Larry, for you and your team spurring us on and to loving good deeds and to, and to loving the Lord with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our strength. All right, church, so now we're going to get started with our worship service. Remember, as always, one of our core values here at Cielo Vista Church is life-changing generosity. We're able to witness some amazing stories of how your generosity has changed lives here in our community, here in El Paso, uh, next door at REL Washington Elementary School, and beyond. So we want to encourage you to continue to seek the Lord in your generosity. You can always give online at cielovista.church or text CVC to 77977 and lean in, raise your hands, sing like no one's listening as we worship together and hear another encouraging message from Pastor Larry. so great Jesus in all things I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years still I'll be singing how can I praise you enough how can I praise you enough you are the Lord in glory Your love is like the wildest ocean Oh, nothing else compares Creation calls all to the Savior We are alive for your praise in earth and sky no one is higher Our God of wonders who reign Our God of wonders who 
Welcome to Sierra Vista Church Online. Delighted to have you a part of our service today. We're going to continue the study of the strategist. This is lesson for the next two weeks. And I want to speak with you today uh, and next week on the way we help Satan. So, wow, I don't, I don't want to help Satan. Well, we do. Before I get into the lesson, I want to show, uh, share a booklet with you. You may have read this. It's called From Pride to Humility by Stuart Scott. Uh, Stuart's not a relative of mine, so I'm not trying to push his booklet, but I will tell you it's 34 pages of excellent material about pride and humility that can come in all of our lives. And if you would say today, you know what, uh, Larry, I don't, I don't think I've got any pride in my life, uh, I would disagree with you. You may have some people around you who would disagree with you. We all do. It's the original sin, Genesis chapter 3, the fall where Eve just basically said, I'll, uh, I want to do what I want to do. And Adam, want, I want, Adam said, I want to do what I want to do. And we, we know what God says, 
But here's what we're going to do. So the original sin in all of us is pride. Uh, I read a quote a long time ago by Oswald Chambers. It's a wonderful booklet, a devotional booklet called My Utmost for His Highest. Oswald Chambers said this, that when we know things about people, it is not the opportunity for us to criticize them, but to pray for them. Now, how challenging is that? All of us are going to know things about other people. We're going to know other things about family members, about people at church, about people at work. We're going we're to know things. We're going to hear things about other people. We're going to know things about other people. But I love the wisdom of Oswald Chambers, who said, when we know things about other people, it's not the reason, it's not the excuse, it's not the time to criticize other people as much as it is a time to pray for other people. And I think that's so very powerful. But I want to share a few thoughts from, from Stewart's booklet. Uh, one of the things that he says, Thomas Watson, who was a Puritan, he quotes Thomas Watson in his booklet about pride. He says, pride seeks to un-God God. Well, that's, that's very true. He goes on to say, Stewart in his booklet talks about one of the primary evidences of pride in all of our lives is self-pity. Uh, no one knows the trouble I'm going through. No one cares about me. No one thinks about me. No one is concerned about me. Well, no one, no one is there to help me. Self-pity is really an outward expression of the inward manifestation of pride in our lives. Uh, and then he, he goes on, on page five of his book, he says, to sum it all up, proud people believe that life is all about them. So pride is the way we help Satan, unbridled pride in our lives. Now, if you read Stewart's booklet, again, 34 pages long, he goes in, into 30 different characteristics in our lives about pride. Again, if you'd say, Larry, I don't, I don't have pride in my life. You do, you do, all of us do. It just comes out in certain ways that maybe we're not accustomed to, or maybe, maybe some of you thought, I never thought about self-pity being a form of pride. It is, self-pity is a form of pride. And so he goes through 30 characteristics of pride. I promise you, you go through all 30 characteristics, there's going to be one or 12 or 15 that are going to apply to every single one of us. Number 17, here's what Stuart says, pride, being defensive or blame shifting. It's the person who says, I mean, are you saying it's my fault? Well, what about you? What, 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 how, how, are you how is this part of your fault too? Blame shifting. Uh, number 19 uh, is a, a form of pride when he says it's the lack of asking for forgiveness. All of us, all of us need to be forgiven. And all of us at certain times in our lives need to go and ask someone to forgive us. That's just the way it works. Prideful people will say, well, if they come and ask for forgiveness, I'll think about forgiving them. Well, that, that's, that's complete pride. Uh, it goes number 21 of the 30 characteristics. One of them is resisting authority or being disrespectful. Resisting authority or being <laughs> disrespectful. Uh, years ago, there was a man who was going about, Bill Gothard is his name. He was going around doing big, big conferences for people. And, and I don't even know what happened to Bill. You can Google his name probably and find out. But Bill Gothard was filling up arenas. And one of the statements he said, this is years ago. One of the statements he said this. He said, people who are habitually late have a problem with authority. And I thought, that, that's, that's true because people who are habitually late, and I'm talking about they're always late, would say this, I'll, I'll, we, we can start when I get there. Well, that's, that's pride. I will tell you this, years ago, I was working for a, a pastor, strong leader, 
And I was in my office one day, and one day he walked in. He'd been to church just a few, oh, probably about six months or less. He walked into my office, and I said, oh, come in. He came in, and he put down an 11 by 17 sheet of paper on my desk that had the organizational chart of the church. And I remember looking at this organizational chart and I found myself at the very, very bottom of a department in this organization, this church. And I remember thinking to myself, why am I all the way down there? And I looked at the person who was ahead of me and I thought, why am I below that leader? I'm a better leader than what that person is. Can I tell you what was going on in my heart that day? You figured it out, didn't you? It was pride. Uh, when, when you and I are in an organization and we say to ourselves, I'm not going to submit to that person, that's pride. Uh, when we look at the organizational chart and we see someone or some ones ahead of us and we go, that's not right. I'm a better leader than he is. I'm a better leader than she is. What we're saying is our pride is on full display. I'm not discounting the fact you may be a better leader, but the person who is in ultimate authority in that organization has created the organizational chart. And wherever you are on the organizational chart, you may be way, way down there like I I mean, I had to get a magnifying glass to see where I was on the organizational chart. I dealt with it, but I tell you, at the beginning, when I first saw that, it angered me, it bothered me, it wasn't right, I'm a better leader. And you know what, I look back on that experience and what I was, I was a prideful pastor on a staff that didn't recognize that God set the authority up in that organization. It wasn't my job to set up the organizational structure. It was that leader's job. And I was in rebellion against that leader. Call it what it is. You can try to frame it any way you want to. You can try to sidestep it. Uh, I did. I did. But then I had to realize, you know what that is? That is pride at the core of my heart. So one of the ways we display pride, 30 characteristics in Stewart's booklet, is resisting authority or being disrespectful. Now, as you get to the end of Stuart's booklet, he gives you, he gives all of us 30, 30 ways how we can recognize humility in our lives. Well, that's an introduction because pride has a way of seeping into all of us. And just about the time we feel so good about our humility, we discover that we have been Oh, we've repelled people because of our pride. What was unnoticeable to us was painfully obvious to other people. And so pride is something we all have in common. And with our pride, we help Satan do his job. It's easy to point out pride in others while being amazed at how we were able to reach the pinnacle of humility with such ease. I mean, if somebody ever in a community group or a church or in a, in a setting with other people and somebody just says, I, I just, I'm trying to figure out when I became, became such a humble person. Oh my goodness. About the time you and I think we're very humble, we're not. Pride is leading the way. And pride is defined as this, an undue sense of our own superiority is raising up ourselves above God and others. The result of pride is very predictable. Let me say that one more time. The result or the results of pride, very predictable. Our relationship with God and others is affected severely. And see, pride never enhances relationships it destroys relationships. A proud person is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you and I are looking down, uh, we cannot see something that is above us. As long as we are proud, we cannot know God. That was a quote by C.S. Lewis. The ancient Old Testament writer Solomon 
who laid out a compelling case against pride. Now, the, those of you watching this and you'd say, Larry, I, I believe in the authority of the word of God. And you know what I would say to you? I do too. I believe in the authority of God's word from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. I suspect you'd do the same. You'd say God's word is perfect. I would say the very same thing. You'd say God's, God's word is without error. I'd say, I believe the same thing. Uh, I believe that there are many followers of Christ who love and read and study, and they would say, they would, they would say I want to obey every aspect of God's word. They say that until they come up against the authority of Scripture that says something about the ugliness of their life, or I say the ugliness of my life, and then we have a challenge. We have to do something with it. We have to wrestle with it. We have to submit to it. Uh, God's word oftentimes grinds slowly in our lives where we say, I must submit to the authority of God's word. And what that means is I must change an attitude in my life. I need to change an action in my life. I need to change how I look at that brother, that sister, or that person whom I violently disagree with, violently not in action, but in violently in the antithesis of how we would view our world. And so was the ancient writer Solomon, a compelling case where he said this about pride. He said this, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Another one, Proverbs 13, 10. Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 5. The Lord detests the proud. They will surely be punished. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Proverbs 18 12. Haughtiness goes before destruction. Humility precedes honor. And then Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 4. Haughty eyes, a proud heart, and evil actions are all sin. It's interesting when you read the Word of God and how God lays out the compelling case, like Solomon laid out the compelling case from his journal, uh, God never says anything good about pride. Uh, he detests it. In fact, God's word said, God, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, now, why does God resist the proud? Can, can I tell you something? Prideful people don't need God. They've got it all figured out. Uh, if Solomon could speak now, he'd probably say this. Uh, Larry, call your name out. Do you need further evidence about the destructive nature of pride. The common thread in pride is this, disgrace, scripture tells us, disgrace, conflict, punishment, destruction, and sin. Uh, if, if you look at the common thread of relationships, regardless of what they are, relationships that have been derailed, uh, if you trace it back far enough, if people are honest enough, if people have enough self-awareness, if there's enough humility in the reason the relationship derailed, they'll say this, is because of pride. It, it may have manifested itself in a lot of other categories, a lot of titles. We may have given a name to it. We may have given certain language to what caused the derailment of our relationship, but no, it, it was pride. See, see, no one hires a prideful employee. No one does. Or, or no one makes the decision to go to work for an egomaniac boss. But any work environment can be a greenhouse 
for prideful gladiators who battle every day over a title, they'll battle over a position, uh, they'll battle over some kind of money. How come they got a raise and I didn't? How come she got the credit for the idea? I didn't. It was my idea, not hers. Uh, then people power up and that proves, they want to prove I am somebody. But I'm telling you what, if somebody goes to work and they're bent out of shape because someone's got a title, uh, I would tell you, I would tell you as your friend, if you're bent out of shape because of a title, someone got credit, someone got noticed, someone got the new office, someone got the new office equipment, someone got the new $150 paper shredder and you didn't. Wow. Let me tell you something about you. You're insecure. That describes someone who's insecure. Can I tell you something about all of us? We're all insecure given the right moment and the right setting. And I'm telling you what insecurity really is. Insecurity is a level of pride in our heart because it says this, you got overlooked and we don't like that feeling. We don't like the feeling because then jealousy comes in our heart, which is the opposite of a lack of contentment in our heart. So be careful at work, wherever you work. Just go to work. Do what God asks you to do. Have a great spirit at work. Keep a humble spirit at work. The people above you, wherever you work, they've been placed there in authority, not you. And everyone is under authority, someone's authority somewhere. I'm the lead pastor of a church. I'm under the authority of a board of elders of this church who at any moment can say, you're done and it's over, call you haul They can do that. And so all I'm saying from Stuart's little booklet, but I'm also saying more importantly, from the word of God, if there, if there are pride moments that go unchecked in your life, in my life, we may gloss over it and call it something else, but the breakdown, the relationship breakdown, the work turmoil, the marriage turmoil, the turmoil at church, phrase it any way you want to, it is pride that can creep into our hearts. A man or woman, they repeat marriage vows to one another. Uh, I've done a lot of weddings in the last 37 years. Man, a lot of them. Very, very special couples. Man, woman, they want to get married. Here we go. They say vows to each other. Uh, I've never heard anyone repeat vows. I've never heard the groom repeat vows about his future wife and say, uh, well, she's so arrogant. I take you, my arrogant bride. You're so self-centered. You're narcissistic to the core. But I'm so sure that we're going to have a happy life forever. I've never heard that. I've never heard the bride look at her future husband and say, you know what? He's so full of himself. He's so self-controlling. He's arrogant. He loves to be served. But I'm sure that we're going to be happy forever and forever. Uh, I've never heard that. Did I tell you something? I've never heard someone who begins dating another person. And they, they, they pray this. Oh, God, thank you for sending her into my life. Thank you for sending him into my life. And, and she's so controlling. He's so manipulative. She is so self-centered. But uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be happy in this dating relationship. I, let me, let, hey, I am trying to help someone today. If you are dating someone and all they talk about is themselves, they talk about the wonderful, how fabulous they are and how incredibly gifted they are and, and how they are the fourth member of the Trinity and how how they're God's gift to humanity. Let, let me encourage you today. Run for your life away from him or for, from her. Save yourself a boatload of heartache down the road. 
See, all we need to do is inject a little small trace, small trace of self-serum in a conversation, in a relationship, at church, uh, at work, in a community group, uh, in a dating relationship, in a marriage, in a friendship, the class, the team, and watch conflict, strife, and pettiness emerge. If you're around someone who has the attitude is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm irreplaceable. Like if you're at work and that boss or that employee or that department head or that vice president or that director of sales or that person who's over marketing or whomever it may be in that environment that says this, I don't think this place could get along without me. Uh, you know you're talking to someone who is in const with pride. They are to the core prideful. Or the person that says, no, I'm replaceable. Uh, it's just a privilege to serve here. It's just a privilege to work here. It's just a privilege, you know what, to be married to you. It's a privilege to be dating you. It's a privilege to be serving you. It's a privilege to lead this church. It's a privilege to lead this community group. It's a privilege to lead this ministry. All of us are replaceable. I've told our staff, wonderful staff team here at Seattle Vista Church, uh, this, is, this is not a forever deal. This is a very short run. And, and God will have the next person who prayerfully will take this church to a greater uh, over, greater vision, greater accomplishment, uh, greater purpose, because all of us are replaceable. I don't care what you're doing today, you're replaceable. And you know what? That's how it should be. Until God calls us home, moves us on to the next place, let's do our best. In your marriage, give your best, serve your best, speak your best, be your best. If you're around people, serve your best, be your best, give your best, Think your best. Give your very best to them. Give your very best to the Lord Jesus Christ. Serve Christ with impeccable integrity. Knowing that pride destroys, it creates disharmony. It creates disunity. It bleeds into other areas of trouble. However, if the person will look at Christ, serve Christ, humble themselves before the cross, say, God, it is you who are the one in charge today. God, it is you to whom I serve. God, it is you that I live and serve and breathe under your authority. That's a wise person. That's a very wise person. We'll pick it up next week in the second part of this series. And until then, God bless you. Let me pray for you and for this week. God, thank you for the privilege of serving you. May we glare and stare at the cross today and remind us that while we were yet sinners far from you, Jesus, you stretched your arms out. You took the agony of the cross, the crucifixion you died for us. Remind us of your love for us. And may we serve you not with pride, but may we serve you with gentleness and may we serve you with humility. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless each of you today. Have a prayerful week, a powerful week, and a God-honoring week as you serve the Most High King, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. As scripture says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord. So to better serve the Lord this week, we have a challenge for you. Break outside your comfort zone and become aware of how pride rears its head in your life. Step one would be to pray and ask the Lord to reveal how pride rears its head in your life. Step two would be to actually ask somebody close to you in your community group, friends, parents, maybe your kids, co-workers, somebody you trust to show you your blind spots. Because like Pastor Larry said, we all have pride. We all have these blind spots. But the ironic thing here is that pride would actually keep us from asking someone to show us where we're being prideful. Yeah, so let's get out of that comfort zone and step out and ask that question. Now let's go out and be the church, giving our very best, serving our very best, and thinking the very best.
Love you guys. See you next week.